in a fit of youthful optimism and idealism, I got a PhD in philosophy. <laughs> and as my father said, well, you won't have trouble finding a job because I just opened a bunch of big philosophy factories out near the interstate. <laughs> But I hope to recapture today a little bit of that uh, youthful idealism uh, and enthusiasm and to transmit it to you. Because I really believe that we can be the generation that makes business better. To do that, we need a revolution. Now, it's not a revolution like we talked about in the 60s and those days. It's a, it's a revolution about ideas. It's a conceptual revolution. We need a new story about business. We need to tell a new story. We need to enact a new story about business. The current story about business, you know how it goes. Business is about the money. It's about profits. It's about... Um, being essentially what I would call greedy little bastards out trying to do each other in. <laughs> it's about business people doing whatever they can get away with. You don't believe this, read the newspapers. Um, take a, a critical, I dare I say, philosophical look at popular culture, and you'll see the story that's behind this. There are three flaws in this story about business, three major flaws. The first flaw says that the purpose of business is to make money or for profits. Now, it's not that profits are bad. The flaw is, of course, that you know, people think it's just about the money. It's not that profits are bad. Businesses have to have them. But to say the purpose of business is to make money is a lot like saying, well, I need red blood cells to live so that the purpose of life is to make red blood cells. What? <laughs> Even when you need to focus on making red blood cells, as I did a few years ago when I had a fun weekend by getting both my hips replaced, uh, you had to focus on making red blood cells. That still wasn't the purpose of life. Even when businesses have to focus on ma ma making money because the world changed or they made mistakes, still not the purpose. Entrepreneurs don't start businesses to maximize profits. They don't start businesses just to make money. They start businesses because they're on fire about something. They're on fire about an idea. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were absolutely on fire about their ideas for what the personal computer could do. John Mackey at Whole Foods, on fire about the uh, potential if you had people eat more healthy. The second flaw. The second flaw is embarrassing. I tell people I teach business ethics. See, 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 look at you, listen to you. You know, I don't have to say anything else. People have to, are polite and either have to manage not to laugh, unlike you, <laughs> or they say things like, oh, business ethics, a contradiction like a jumbo shrimp, oxymoron. <laughs> um, or, uh, oh, I didn't know business had any. Or, uh, must be a short course. <laughs> Or more recently, I was in a bar in Copenhagen uh, talking to someone, and they said, what do you do? I said, I teach business ethics. And they go, oh, it's a theoretical subject. <laughs> and I said, now, of this phrase, business ethics, we only misunderstand two of the words, OK? First of all, business. Any business person knows that how you run a great business is you create Great products and services for customers. You have employees who show up and want to be there and be inspired. You have suppliers who want to make you better. You're a good citizen in the community. And if you do those things, you're going to make money. You create value for stakeholders. Right? We, there is a mismatch between the story we tell about business and what we know it takes to run a successful business. But we misunderstand ethics, too. We say ethics are sort of angels and organ music to be talked about in hushed tones on Sunday. 
Tell someone you're interested in talking to that you teach ethics. They'll have to immediately go watch some paint dry <laughs> or perhaps wash their hair several hundred times. Uh, it's, it's, the way, it's the way it goes. Um, but ethics ultimately is about how what we do, how it affects each other. You know, people say, well, you can't make any progress on ethics because you got yours and you got yours and you got yours. Whose do you use? Well, the history of civilization is a history of us figuring out how to have conversations so we can live together. People often say, well, now, wait a minute, Ed. Uh, I, I, I get to make these calls. I have to look myself in the mirror. I have to live with myself. And that's true. You have to live with yourself. The problem is we all got to live with you too. <laughs> so ethics is this very practical stuff about how we live together. And it's at the center of business. Think about those companies you like to do business with as a customer. It's because their stuff does what it says it's going to do. And when it doesn't, uh, they make it right. And there's issues around values and ethics at the center. Whenever you say this business has an ethics issue, no one thinks they brought technology into the world that allows people to do the things that they can do. You automatically think something wrong has happened. We misunderstand both of these words. And there's a mismatch between we know what it takes to run a successful business and the story about business. The third flaw, it's embarrassing to have to say as well, but human beings are complicated. We are not simple beings of pure economic self-interest. Anybody out there have children? I, I think I just proved my point uh, about it not being simple. Um, Harry Levinson was a crusty old bastard. He used to hang out at the Harvard Business School, now dead. And, he was a kind of a Freudian, and he'd ask people sort of, what's the major way people are motivated in companies? And they would say, uh, you know, rewards and punishment, kind of carrots and sticks. And he'd sort of draw a big question mark and go, what animal is in between that? What you think about that? What animal do you think about between a carrot and stick? Yeah, somebody said bunny. That's, that's messed up. <laughs> you, you think about beating a rabbit with a stick? I mean, that's messed up. Uh, uh. What most people said was jackass. <laughs> and so Levinson coined this idea that he called the great jackass fallacy. He said, maybe, just maybe human beings are slightly more complicated than jackasses. And he said, it's a little worse than that because once you start treating them like jackasses, they start nosing for the carrot and start avoiding the stick. Right? And maybe human beings have spiritual lives. Maybe they have emotional lives. Maybe they have political lives. Maybe they have uh, values and families. And we don't check that at the door every day. We walk into work, punch the clock, hear my values, can I pick them up at 5 o'clock? <laughs> Businesses are deeply human institutions. And the flaws in the standard story ignore this. There's a mismatch, a disconnect between the story we tell about business and what we know it takes to run, and this is a technical term, a kick-ass business. <laughs> There's even a mismatch between the story we sometimes teach in business schools and what we know it takes to run a successful business. And sometimes there's even a mismatch between the stories that executives and managers tell about their businesses and what they really know in their hearts it takes to run a successful business. Miles Davis, one of my favorite musicians, he asked a very famous question. So what? <laughs> so what? There's some good news. The good news is that a new story is emerging. A new story about business is being created by people starting and running businesses that can literally revolutionize the world that we live in. This new story says, first of all, business is about purpose. Get the purpose right, profits follow. Fundamentally, being on fire, having passion about starting something and keeping that passion alive 
A friend of mine just took his company public in an IPO. He spent a lot of time trying to figure out how he could keep that passion, that fire alive. Business is about purpose. It's about creating value for stakeholders, not just shareholders. And it's about doing it without making trade-offs. A company I know, the CEO told a story that they wanted to clean up the environment, where they were a big chemical company, and uh, so they announced these very strict pollution goals, or zero pollution, you know, take a generation. But there's a, you know, milestones and ways to get through it, and a very business-like approach. And the CEO is going around making the speech to all the facilities. The engineers in one facility say, "Look, I'm sorry, but we can't, uh, we can't meet these interim goals. This process is too dirty. This plant equipment is too old. We can't do it." And so the CEO says, "Well, okay, you know, we're gonna have to close the plant." Engineers, okay. You know, uh, trade-off. Community, environment on the one hand, employees on the other hand. Community wins, employees lose. Engineers come back about three or four weeks later, as the CEO told the story, and said, well, you know, um, actually, um, miracle. <laughs> we, uh, we figured it out. And the CEO says, well, what's it going to cost? You know, he says, big company, $20, $30 million. And the engineer said, well, you know, we're actually embarrassed to say we do it this new way. We're going to save money. <laughs> what's happening? Trade-offs are unacceptable. When the trade-offs are unacceptable, we kick in the gear. The only infinite resource we have, and that's what's in our minds, our creative imagination, the juice of capitalism, the juice of business, is our desire to create value for other people, to do something together no one of us can do alone, and our ability to imagine a different world. We're only as good as the stories we can tell. We're only as good, we can only live the lives that we can imagine. And imagination and creativity are muscles that atrophy if they're not used. Business is about working together to create value together. So, what do you need to do? You know? The first thing you need to do is to get involved. You need to think for yourself about your own purpose, those groups and individuals that you can affect, your stakeholders, your own values and ethics, and how those things apply in the organizations, whether they're businesses or not-for-profits or whatever the organizations you're a part of, how those things apply. We need to put ethics and values in the center. We need to change the story. We need to change the story of business and change what we expect and what we do. Putting ethics and values at the center, at least on the level with money and profits, is the absolute uh, first step at what we need to do. Second, we need to see conflict. We need to see uh, uh, challenge. We need to see those things as important in what we do. If you have values, but you can't have those values be challenged, my take is you don't have them. If you have a purpose, but somebody can't say to you, you're not living it here. You don't, you're not really committed to your purpose. The way I would say it is that challenge, conflict, critique, just rock. We have to look at those things as the sources of value creation rather than something to be avoided. I was uh, reminded of this in a very dramatic way by my then, uh, now 27-year-old, but then 10-year-old son. When I said to him, I said, uh, Ben, look, I, I can't... Uh, take you to the father-son basketball camp this summer. I've got to be in Indonesia. Uh, I was one of the dads who made one the year before and, and won the, won the three-point shooting title. And uh, 
uh, got a t-shirt, the whole thing, you know, it's my <laughs> one athletic achievement. And Ben looked right at me and he said, uh, Dad, what's more important, your family or your job? <laughs> okay. Now he's 10, so it's not the teenager thing, you know. And I said, well, you know, my family, of course. He said, you're not acting like it. <laughs> and the painful thing was he was right. I wasn't. I could have gone to Indonesia whenever I wanted. And I said, well, I got to go because I made a commitment, and that's an important thing for us. I said, but next summer, I'll stay at home. I'll coach your team. We'll hang out. And I did the next summer and the summer after that, et cetera. And we created a lot of value. But the only reason we created value was that he pushed back. He pushed back against those values. Think about the value that gets left on the table because people don't push back, again, in culturally appropriate ways. Right? So this idea of a culture in business and organizations of challenge and conflict and pushback is what we need to do. And we need to raise the bar. We need to expect more from our companies. We need to expect more from our coworkers. If we can do these things, I believe we can be the generation that makes business better. The good news is companies like Whole Foods, the Container Store, a uh, little company in Northern Virginia, the Motley Fool, companies like Novo Nordisk. Think about what Google and uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter, how they've changed the world. Companies are changing the world. They're changing the world. They're entrepreneurs out changing the world with, business, with the governments and civil society. We are on the verge of a revolution in which we use the right story about capitalism literally to remake our world. We can be the generation that does that. Thank you very much. Thank you.